Hey, Jim, it's always a pleasure. Uh, look, as usual, a lot of questions for you. No, you got a lot of material for us. We'll do our best to get through it all. Let's just start, though, with the high level question I like to ask you at the beginning of every one of these interviews. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, that's a great question, Adam, because uh, a couple of things. Number one, there are two different things. The global economy is is the big topic. That's what we all care about most. But financial markets can come up with their own narratives and go their own way, at least for a while. So you have to they're not in, in sync. They they do. They will be in sync eventually, but uh, not always right away. A lot of times the financial markets get ahead of themselves and then they wake up to reality and they oh, crash, you know, correct down. So there's a little bit of that going on but in terms of the global economy. Um, I think your use of the word global is very much on point because it's often the case that you know you look around the world you know you've got the united states or you know north america if you want to throw in canada you've got the eu you've got china you've got japan they're all important economies but they can kind of be in different uh parts of the business cycle and it's not unusual for one part to be in recession but another part of the world is like doing better so then they use the uh, phrase locomotive theory you know the locomotive is going to pull us all out of the ditch you know and, and we'll get going so it's not unusual to have recessions in the united states or europe or particular countries in europe or japan i mean japan said nine recessions since 1989 i mean nine uh, i consider that one long 30-year depression that's that's a debate for another day but i would just that's how i would describe japan but it, it usually um you know one's not doing so well and another part of the world's doing better uh, that's not the case. What is happening right now, I see it, but there's a you know an awful lot of data to back it up, is that we are going into or may already be in a global recession. Now that's rare. It's it's rare when hey, China, Japan, US, Germany, they're all in recession at the same time. But that's what's unfolding. That's a big deal. Uh, well, for obvious reasons, uh, uh, because uh, you know it affects uh, basically everyone. But um, there's no life preserver. There's no you know. You know, it's not like China's going to pull us all out of it with cheap exports, or or Japan's going to you know put the pedal to the metal in terms of um, you know fixing uh, fixed uh, asset investment, uh, you know, et cetera. So so that's a really bad sign. I mean, and just to be very specific, you know, we just saw U.S. fourth quarter GDP grew at a 2.9 percent annualized rate. People are like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and you know, it's not good by post 1980 standards it's not good at all by post world war ii standards but post 2008 yeah that's not that's not bad um but uh again you have to disaggregate it and you look at what grew it was uh, inventories were a big contributor uh and net exports were a big contributor um and uh consumer uh, uh non uh, sorry consumer durables but but sorry a fi fixed asset investment in particular there was a big um, load of um, uh, aircraft orders for Boeing, which is notoriously lumpy. You know, they, they'll have a big month, blowout month, and then nothing for a couple of months, not nothing, but, you know, something very low. So when you look at that, uh, inventories are counted as part of GDP, of course, but it's not necessarily a good thing. If inventories are piling up, it means retailers are not buying. The stuff's arriving, and this kind of goes back to the whole supply chain breakdown of a year ago. That's what my book sold out was about. So you go back to, uh, say, the spring of 2022. The supply chain had completely fallen apart. And if you were a purchasing manager and you were, you were saying to yourself, um, okay, we're kind of coming out of COVID, we're, we're, we're going to start growing, uh, but the supply chain is broken. So instead of ordering one you know, container, I'm going to order three containers because maybe one will get through, you know, through the bottlenecks. I only want one, but I'm going to order three and hope for the best. What happened was some of that, a lot of the stuff was alleviated, not for good reasons, not really for logistical reasons, but because the consumers slowed down a lot beginning in June, partly in reaction to the Fed starting to hike rates in March of uh, 2022. Uh, and then here come the three containers. So at this at the at the exact moment when uh, demand destruction is kicking in, your inventory is going to the rafters. So what do retailers do, or wholesalers for that matter? But retail they slash prices. That you know two for one sales. Uh, you know because inventories are uh, a nightmare for retailers for obvious reasons. Number one, you have to finance them, so they eat up working capital. It could be cash, but now you know you got a bunch of stuff in the back office. And number two, it just takes up space. I mean, it, it insurance costs and, and other costs like that. But the other thing people kind of underestimate is that like style, uh, fashion, goes, stuff goes out of fashion. You know, last spring's styles are not next spring styles. You still got last spring stuff. Good luck. You know, it's 
it, we're getting close to spring. So you're dumping that stuff. Um, you know, consumer electronics, uh, you know, you got an iPhone 13. Well, everybody wants an iPhone 14, you know, whatever. I mean, you take the point. So, um, so piling up inventories is a very unhealthy sign. It means the retail sector is drying up, demand destruction is kicking in, costs are going up because you got to finance all this stuff and your profit margins are going down. So I don't take a lot of comfort from that. But the other thing, Adam, and this is important, you know, quarters, three months, obviously, if to the extent you can disaggregate monthly data, and there's a lot of monthly data, yeah, 2.9% annualized for the quarter, but it really slowed down in December. So it's sort of, it was sort of a waning type of thing. Um, Christmas was a disaster. I mean, yeah, people bought stuff for Christmas, but way below expectations. And again, it goes back to piling up the inventory at the worst possible time. So it looks like the U.S. is going into 2023 Possibly recession started in December. If not, it we expect it to start soon. But you're seeing the same thing in Europe now. Europe got a break with the weather. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a war going on, so that's a big factor. But um, uh, you know, and natural gas prices uh, skyrocketed, and, uh, and and oil prices skyrocketed um, again in mid uh, 2022. They've come down, uh, and. They people expected them, and I'm going to include myself, to go up again because of the winter. But the winter turned out to be pretty mild. I saw pictures of you know people like kayaking around Copenhagen. You know, it was like in t-shirts. You know, so so that that was the break. That's you know act of God, but uh, but it works. Um, so uh, so they got a little bit of a break, but it doesn't mean that you know all is well or or they're out of the woods. And there are there are other things going on. China is a basket case. Um, they're zero, you know, they went from zero COVID, which was, you know, it was bad public policy and bad health policy, but they did it anyway, maybe for political reasons, because Xi was trying to get through the National Party Congress in uh, uh, October uh, uh, 2022. Um, but he did, and he's emperor for life, and, you know, the new emperor Xi. Um, so they flipped almost on a dime. Now, there were riots beginning November 24th. 2022, uh, pretty bad ones. They people raged through cities. They tore down all these testing tents. They knocked down barricades. They hung banners. And, and the leadership in Beijing, they're looking at this thing in Tiananmen Square, 1989. So they just turned on a dime and said, "Okay, let it rip." The, the positive letter, "Okay, let everyone get infected, and we'll do the best we can." And um, but uh, but the, one of the ways you get through it is by letting it rip. And you develop what's called herd immunity, and that's what worked in North America and Europe. Um, and uh, so China decided to let it rip. But when you look at the numbers, you're like, OK, you have one point uh, uh, sorry, one point four billion people. So you take a, a modest infection rate, meaning, you know, like 30 percent, let's say uh, you're talking, you know, round number 450 million infections. And if you assume a modest mortality rate, at one quarter, one percent, and that's that's borne out by the data. You're looking at uh, close to two million dead. Um, now, those are on conservative assumptions. If you and if you dial up the infection rate to closer to fifty percent and the mortality rate to one half of one percent, now you're looking at five million dead. Um, again, round numbers. Um, but the other difference with, between China and Europe and, and the U.S. is that they don't have the healthcare system to deal with it. Our healthcare system, which is pretty good, was strained. Same thing in Europe. China has nowhere near the ICU unit, the ICU units, the oxygen, um, the uh, the treatments, uh, the just the, the professionals, the nurses and doctors, not even close. And when you get out to the village level, which is where most of the people still live, believe it or not, um, they uh, they often have nothing. Um, and it actually is an interesting supply chain twist there because the Chinese were more or less told, you have to self-medicate. We we don't have the, the hospital beds for you. So they went out and bought the strip, the shelves of ibuprofen, Tamiflu, uh, you know, uh, Motrin, uh, cough medicine, whatever they could get. Um, and uh, they, the Beijing actually said, you know, go back to uh, TCM. And like, what's TCM? It's like traditional Chinese medicine, you know, herbs mm -hmm. and teas and things like that. Well, I'm, I'm not knocking it, by the way. Some of that stuff's pretty healthy, but that's they're, they're at a primitive level. They're like kind of at a, you know, a, a, the Bronze Age level. Um, but, uh, but that is hurting the economy as much as the zero COVID. They're, they're, they had no good ways out. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They're both awful. But uh, but you still have a lot of things that are not COVID. The real estate collapse, the excessive debt, the demographic decline, um, just the impact of top-down management when you can't possibly get everything right. You know, and so and decoupling from the U.S. and the U.S. cutting off, um, you know, high-tech 
exports to China, including third country exports where they're relying on U.S. licenses or equipment. So China's in a deep hole, probably in a recession. Japan, same thing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that. Um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. But they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession 